It's such a pleasure to welcome all of you here this morning and really a pleasure to welcome Senator Cardin. Um, as you all know, he's been a really strong advocate for human rights and our foreign policy for years, and we would be in sad shape without his leadership. Um, he's particularly appropriate, though, to be speaking this morning because he was the co-author, along with the late Senator McCain, of the original Magnitsky Act, which focused on Russia, and then also co-authored the Global Magnitsky Act, which took that global. Um, and for those of you who don't know a lot about what the act does, it enables targeted sanctioning of individuals or entities for either involvement in human rights abuses or corruption. And so really on that note, I just want to hand over to Senator Cardin because I know this is his legislation. He'll have a lot to say. Amy, first of all, thank you very much. And to CSIS, thank you for hosting this, giving us an opportunity. I must tell you, when I got the invitation, I was hopeful that I would not be here, that Congress would have adjourned by now. But no such luck. And you could have probably had this between Christmas and New Year's, and we would still be here. Uh, maybe even on January 2nd, this Congress will still be in session. You never know. But anyway, it's really good to be here. I thank you. Uh, I, I know a lot of people in this room, and I thank you for your uh, advocacy of human rights. Uh, it is a, a powerful motivator for all of us. Amy mentioned my uh, co-authorship with the late Senator McCain. Uh, I became good friends with Senator McCain. We became real buddies. And in case you haven't followed our careers that closely, you will notice that we have different priorities on most issues as to how to deal with the issues of our country. But human rights brought us together. And it was a, a true friendship and partnership to advance human rights uh, globally. Our, I miss Senator McCain. Uh, and he will be missed in the 116th Congress, make no mistake about it. But let me uh, tell you that we've had continued success. Uh, last night, the United States Senate passed the Ellie Wiesel Atrocity Prevention Act, uh, and we hope to get that cleared in the House shortly. There was some amendments suggested by the House that we needed to put on there in the Senate, so we need to get it done. Uh, but we expect that to happen. And I would like to uh, acknowledge Algene Sajari for her incredible work on the staff on that particular issue and getting that, uh, getting that done and so many other issues. Those of you who have followed my career know that I will always emphasize America's strength. We are the global leader of the world. And many people believe we're the global leader because of our economic strength or our military strength. We are the global leader of the world because of our values and what we bring to the table and how we can provide inspiration to people around the world to demand democratic institutions in their country and representative governments. So we always must recognize that America is strongest when it stands for its values and represents those values. And that's how we protect our national security interests. This past Monday was Human Rights Day, this, the 70th anniversary of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. U.S. leadership from the ashes of World War II and the Holocaust uh, developing a civilized society that stands for the advancement of human rights. In 1975, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe was created. A year later, the Helsinki Commission in the United States was created in order to implement the commitments that the Europe countries, the Soviet Union, the United States, and Canada believed should be advanced. And the U.S. Helsinki Commission has become the focal point to develop strategies to advance the human rights agenda here in America. And when I was first elected to the House of Representatives, my closest friends, Denny Hoyer, who was chair of the commission, uh, asked that I go on that commission and work with him. And I readily agreed. 
my interest in human rights uh, was motivated first by the plight of the Soviet Jews trying to leave the Soviet Union, which was a priority within the Helsinki Commission. But so many human rights issues were advanced by the, human, by the Helsinki Commission in getting our country in a workable strategy to advance human rights. They dealt with Europe's involvement in ending the apartheid government of South Africa. U.S. leadership was indispensable in getting that done through the Helsinki Commission. The problems of the countries suffering from Soviet domination behind the Iron Curtain. I, the, my visits behind the Iron Curtain as a commissioner on the Helsinki Commission, I will never forget talking to people who looked upon us as their eyes and, and voices in a world in which their country was turning their back on their rights. Trafficking in human beings was a major initiative that we started in Congress through the Helsinki Commission that's led to international efforts to end modern day slavery. And the strategy that was deployed was a strategy of name and shame that you can't be quiet about human rights violations. You, you need to expose it. And you need to personalize it. One would think when you mention the thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people whose human rights have been violated, that that would be enough to motivate international action to hold those responsible, accountable, and to make sure that we plant seeds to prevent these disasters and human rights tragedies from occurring in the future. But it's not. You need to personalize it. You need to, to point out the individual tragedy in order to prevent these mass atrocities from occurring. So the Sergei Magnitsky issue came to my attention in 2008 when I was the Senate Chair of the Helsinki Commission. It was brought to my attention that a young lawyer in Russia was defending a business interest and discovered corruption in the Russian government and did what any lawyer is required to do, report it to authorities. As a result, he was imprisoned. And that case came to the Helsinki Commission for us to take a look at. We decided we would put a spotlight on it. There was nothing terribly unusual about Sergei Magnitsky. Russia imprisoned opposition people all the time, including their own citizens. But we wanted to showcase the fact that a lawyer, a young lawyer, should not be imprisoned for doing what is right in fighting corruption in his own country. So, so we spoke out about that. Shortly thereafter, on November 16, 2009, we learned that Sergei Minetsky lost his life in prison, that he had been tortured, and that he had been denied medical care. We wanted to do something about it. We thought that if you're going to prevent human rights violators in the future, you have to hold accountable those who are committing human rights violations. Accountability is the first remedy for prevention so that those that are contemplating action know that there will be consequences if they pursue those, those actions. So, as the chair of the Helsinki Commission, I sent a letter to the State Department and suggested that there be accountability to a list of individuals who we knew were involved in the Sergei Magnitsky tragedy. At the time, I had suggested to the State Department that they revoke their visas to visit the United States. The State Department has the absolute right to do that. The response I got from the State Department was disappointing but not surprising. It was during the period of the reset of the relationship between Russia and the United States. The Obama administration was not interested in complicating that relationship with a little problem concerning Sergei Magnitsky and holding those who have perpetrated the, the uh, human rights violations accountable. So I got, I would say, the normal response. We're looking into it. 
We have the power to do what we need to do. We don't need your involvement. We'll take care of it. Just leave it be. Well, we did not just leave it be. We recognized that we had to do more about that. But it was not easy. The path was not easy. So partnering with Senator McCain, I introduced the Mcnitsky statute that would go beyond just revoking the visas for those who violate human rights, but that would also deal with their ability to use the American banking system. And it was global in our introduction. It was aimed at the tragedy of Sergei Mcnitsky, but the application was global. Well, we got a lot of pushback. We got pushback in that this is not the proper role for Congress to conduct foreign policy. It's up to the executive branch. Let us handle how we deal with the relationships of other countries. Well, we did not accept that, and we pursued further. We believe that the legislature had a role to play. And yes, we understand diplomacy, but senators and congressmen do not have to be diplomats. We can say it directly what it is. And we were able to find a vehicle in order to pass this bill. We couldn't get it done on its own merits because there was just too much opposition from the administration. Uh, we recognize that. So we found a must-pass bill, the permanent normal trade relations with Russia that was required under the World Trade Organization. And we're able to convince the administration who wanted to get that bill done uh, that this was a good addition to it. But the price for getting it done in the House was to limit it to the Magnitsky case itself, something that I objected to and Senator McCain objected to. But we were unable to, to win on that issue. So we were able to pass the, in, in 2012 uh, the act of Sergei Magnitsky that applied only to, to Russia. But it's helpful to have the chairman of the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee on your, Senate Armed Services Committee on your side. Because every year we pass the National Defense Authorization Act, a must pass bill, in which Chairman McCain sits in the conference committee and is one of the traffic cops as to what can get into that bill. So working with my friends on the Senate Foreign, Affair, uh, Foreign Relations Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, with Senator McCain's leadership, in 2017 we were able to get into the National Defense Authorization Act, the Global Magnitsky. And it's become one of the most important tools we have to fight human rights violations around the world. It showed U.S. leadership. It showed U.S. leadership. We were told initially, why would America want to put itself at a disadvantage and offend other countries by naming their citizens for, for being unable, unable to visit our country or to use banking? Won't they just go to other countries and develop closer relationships with other countries? We showed leadership and other countries have followed. Three other countries have passed uh, the global Magnitsky law, including the UK, Estonia, and Canada. So we are showing that if we lead, others follow. I want to thank the NGO community for getting this done. We couldn't have gotten it done without the, uh, without the NGO community. And, and Rob Bershinsky's here, and he'll talk about that on the panel about their role that they played, also Freedom House, and many, so many other groups were involved in getting this done. I want to thank those that were our friends in the administration. We had friends in the Obama administration. No stronger friend than, uh, than uh, Tom Olinowski, who now is a congressman from New Jersey, helped us in strategies to implement it, even though there was opposition among the, uh, members of the State Department. And in the Trump administration, we had friends that enabled us to, uh, to get the Executive Order 13818, which expands the Magnitsky protections in the Trump administration. The point I'm raising is that Magnitsky in and of itself was not a unique tragedy. It was a common experience, unfortunately, in Russia. We made Magnitsky a household word 
in order to prevent more Magnitsky's from happening in the future. And that has worked. We now have the horrible tragedy of, of Jamal Khashoggi. His tragedy is a little bit more unique than Sergei Magnitsky. We don't see too many people who are cut up and taken away out of an embassy every day. But it's a tragedy of these types of murders taking place under the auspices of the Saudis is not that unusual. And we now need to use this episode to advance human rights, to make it clear that no one, no one, including a crown prince, is immune from accountability in committing a gross violation of human rights. And once again, it's going to be necessary for the United States Congress to act on this issue and show that the United States will lead on accountability for human rights violations. That is what we intend to do. Unlikely you get it done this year, but we will continue in our quest in the next Congress. The Magnitsky statute has been very effective. 101 individuals and entities have been sanctioned under global Magnitsky, including most recently 17 Saudis in regards to the tragic death of the journalist. Congress has initiated reviews by the process in which we notify the administration of individuals we want considered for Magnitsky sanctions. That has worked. One example that I was personally involved with was sanctions in regards to the horrible tragedy on the Rohingya Muslim population in Burma. It is frequently mentioned in the human rights debates here in America and around the world. Magnitsky statutes, Magnitsky sanctions have been mentioned in regards to Venezuela, in regards to China, in regards to Saudi Arabia, and I can mention many other countries in which we in Congress are looking at legislating in regards to legislation involving those countries, the use of Magnitsky, as well as whether the administration will use Magnitsky as one of the tools in dealing with human rights violations in those countries. And if you want to understand how effective this law has been, look at the Helsinki summit between Mr. Putin and Mr. Trump. I've been told it was one of the first issues that Mr. Putin raised. And we know about some of the famous conversations that took place in 2016 involving Magnitsky's sanctions. It is something that is very much on the minds of autocratic leaders around the world uh, who are using these types of tactics. So I'm looking forward as to how we can make the Magnitsky statute even more effective. One of the areas we really need to look at is the geographical application of the Magnitsky statute. We have serious challenges here, serious challenges as to whether it is being applied as a tool in all regions. One is the capacity of our missions and country to be able to evaluate and recommend individuals for sanctions. Our missions are stretched as far as their budgets are concerned and priorities. We need to make sure that they get the resources they need and have the priority to deal with human rights violations. Secondly, we need to hold our missions accountable, accountable to make those recommendations on the use of Magnitsky sanctions. Here I have talked to the assistant regional secretaries to make sure we have a consistent policy in all regions of the world for understanding the needs of the use of human rights uh, sanctions. And that is starting to take place, but a lot more work needs to be done. We need to make sure that we expand the universe of what is covered by human rights sanctions. We have a long way to go in regards to the LG LBGT community. And I was very proud of Senator Hatch's comments on the floor of the Senate yesterday to the conservative elements that they need to stand up for the rights of all citizens. We need to make sure that the Magnitsky laws are being applied to all human rights violations. One area that is particularly in need of improvement is dealing with the issue of corruption. 
Corruption is the fuel of corrupt leaders, of, of leaders who repressive regimes that are, that are repressing their population. And we need to be a leader on dealing with anti-corruption, including the use of sanctions. So I've introduced legislation that will likely not be passed in this Congress, we'll take it up again in the next Congress, that has the United States providing a, a way of judging every country's efforts to combat corruption, giving us at least the tools in our embassies to go after corrupt regimes. Uh, using the same type of a mechanism that we've used in trafficking in persons report, where we characterize how well a country is doing. And if they fail to meet basic tests, there are consequences. There are consequences in trafficking. There should be consequences in corruption. Certainly, it should affect the, uh, the ability to get U.S. aid and how that aid is restricted if they have corrupt regimes. And yes, the uh, Magnitsky Law is intended to deal with those who are, uh, corruption is part of their life. So we should be able to get a better way of using all sanctions against fighting corruption. To me, that should be a prior priority going into the 116th Congress. We should look at legislative improvements to Magnitsky. We'll be required to do that under the sunset provision that, exp that sunsets the law in 2022. I know that's a while off, but I think we should be looking at how we can strengthen the Magnitsky statute so that it can accomplish its purpose. Its purpose is not to just hold accountable those who perpetrate these, these uh, violations, but to prevent uh, these types of uh, conduct in the first place. We need to fight for budget support. I said earlier, the missions don't have the capacity in many countries to, to deal with uh, adequately handling the responsibilities. You have to make sure that the enforcing agencies have adequate resources, whether it's Treasury or State Department, uh, to go after uh, violators. And certainly we need to expand the universe on uh, countries applying Magnitsky statutes. We're much, much stronger when we have un more unity in the, in, the, uh, in the civilized world to fight those who are violating human rights. So it's important that the EU act. That should be our target to get the European Union on board in regards to global Magnitsky. Our work today is more important than ever before. Uh, you know, we say that frequently. It's true today. We've seen a backsliding on democracy around the world. We've seen President Trump attack the free media, the judiciary, the Congress, and whoever else he wants to. That's not what the leader of the free world should be doing. We see NATO allies, such as Hungary and Turkey, with repressive regimes. We see the Philippines with extrajudicial killings. We need to be more engaged than ever in regards to democratic principles. Hate is on the rise. When hate's on the rise, violence is on the rise. Violations of human rights are on the rise. We need to hold accountable those who violate human rights in order to show that it is our priority and that we are serious about preventing this type of conduct. Our work has never been more important than it is today. And I'm just proud to work with so many people in this room in order to advance human rights here in America and around the world. Thank you for your work. Now, I don't want to hold you too long from a very distinguished panel that's following me, but I was told I had to take a couple friendly questions. So. It, yes. Thank you so much for sponsoring such an important uh, act. Thank you, Senator, for everything you do. Um, I am Uyghur, and as you mentioned, China. Uh, today, I was uh, happy to see the other uh, parts of the world, like Congo, Nigeria included. But uh, how about? 12 million Uyghurs who are being persecuted in China today and more than 2 million Uyghurs who are in the concentration camps. What do we need to do to get those who are accountable for those such a horrendous atrocity? 
under the uh, Global Magnitsky Act. Well, you're absolutely right. We, we, we agree with you. We do believe this is an area in which we have not used the Magnitsky statute effectively, and it's an area in which Congress is looking at whether we need to inter intercede beyond just the use of the, um, the list of sending over to the State Department, but whether there's other actions we need to take to make it clear that we do believe that we haven't used this, the Magnitsky statute effectively in dealing with this problem. So uh, we agree with you. Yes? I think the, the I think that's why don't you take the question there? We'll come back to you. Yes. Thank you. My name is Claire Ginner from the Embassy of Switzerland. You mentioned the role of the EU in the, exp in the geographic expansion for the application of the Global Magnitsky Act. Could you elaborate more on that? On Monday, a, l a lot of leaders actually announced that they want to commit to similar legislation. The leaders, I didn't hear the last part of your question. Uh, last week, um, a lot of leaders got together to discuss global Magnitsky sanctions in Europe as well. And on Monday, for the anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they also publicly announced that they want to move towards global Magnitsky sanctions on a European level. Right. If you look at the evolution of Magnitsky, it of course first started with those that were responsible for the tragedy of Sergei Magnitsky. When it became global, which was only two years ago, three years ago, so it's only been uh, being applied for a relatively short period of time. We knew we were going to have challenges. It depended upon, in some respects, the activism of different missions as to getting the information necessary that state and treasury needed in order to make a case for the use of the sanctions. Some areas were much more advanced than others that had human rights challenges. So we recognize that. And that's why I say we really do need to expand. China is a good example where we have not used it effectively enough. We, we know that. I can, they're, they're, you know, we're starting to use it in Venezuela. We didn't have that capacity going in. Burma, we have a, a limited number of, of cases that have been referred to us. So, and there are some of, uh, of you know, it, we just saw in the Saudi 17, um, we don't know whether that should be the end or not. Many of us think we still haven't held all accountable that need to be held accountable in regards to the, the tragedy there. S Africa, we have certainly not been as aggressive as we need to in Africa with the human rights violations that are taking place on that continent and then on our own hemisphere. So there's, there, we, we know we can do better. If the Europeans join us in this, then we share information and then we do get a more balanced application of this process. We are not the sole uh, um, the repository of information about who, where human rights violations are occurring. The more we can share with our allies, the better we can, I think, apply the statute in a fairer way. So yes, it's important that we have Canada and, and UK uh, and Estonia that are also using this process and that information is being shared. If we had EU, it would be even stronger and I think it would be more balanced on the use of the sanctions. There was a question up here. Um, Good morning, Senator. Uh, in, the Europeans have a human rights commission and the United Nations also has one. In America, we have the Bill of Rights that are applicable universally within the country. Uh, considering, considering the human rights problem abroad, uh, we are reminded that this is in the area of international law. The Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte used to tell his legions and generals, you talk about all this, uh, not going, conquering them. How many, how many legions has the Pope? Mm. In other words, in the area of human rights, we're dealing with, a, with, a, with an issue of papal authority, where Enforcement is a difficult issue. And in that sense, maybe America is a little more advanced with the Manaski Act, which uh, applies sanctions and all that. But beyond that, Senator, do you think that there might be other 
ways of enforcing human rights oh, across yes. boundaries. Oh, absolutely. I'm, look, look, Magnitsky is a tool. I think one of the most important tools we have. But there are certainly, you know, America's uh, engagement globally, whether it's our foreign assistance. Uh, I already said that we should restrict foreign assistance, either in amount or how it's used in countries that violate basic human rights. We do that for, for those that are not doing what's right on preventing modern day slavery. We should do that also for corruption. We should do that also for other areas where we restrict U.S. economic involvement. Uh, we should also restrict our military involvement. We are talking about right now on the floor of the United States Senate, a vote will take place today, whether U.S. military engagement in Yemen is helping deal with the, human, with the humanitarian crisis in Yemen or not. I believe it's not. I believe our military shouldn't be participating with the Saudis. That vote will take place today, and I believe I'll be in the majority today. So yes, there's a lot of things we can do in addition to applying individual sanctions. But individual sanctions are important because they're individuals who make these decisions. And if they can't visit their wealth here in the United States or keep their wealth here in the United States, believe me, it makes a difference. I'll let you pick the next. Thank you, Senator. My name is Sarah Rutherford and I work for Georgetown University's Institute for Women, Peace and Security. With the recent Nobel Peace Prize, I think the topic of sexual violence and conflict is on many of our minds. And I know this summer, many of us were excited to hear you raise the possibility of using Magnitsky's sanctions to address this particular form of human rights violations. And I'm curious if there's been any progress on that and if you're thinking of amending the Magnitsky Act to specifically address uh, sanctions on this on sexual violence and conflict as a specific designation criteria. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Gender is one of the issues that we do believe is, uh, you know, women's rights are human rights. We've said that many times. We do believe this is eligible. Uh, we, ha we have uh, two matters that are important for us to get done. We have the WE Act, which is um, uh, right now in the process, we hope, of clearing both the House and Senate and being sent to the President before the end of the year that will ingrate in all of our foreign policy decisions gender equity issues, including uh, violence against women. We also have the Reauthorization of Violence Against Women's Act that we are providing resources. So yes, w you're absolutely correct. We, that we very much believe that how a country treats its women, particularly as it relates to violence, but also as it relates to economic empowerment, it's a human rights issue, and we should use all of the tools at our disposal to advance uh, gender equality. Am I supposed to pick? You pick. <laughs> I don't want to hold up the uh, uh, panel too long, so why don't we take two more questions. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, Jennifer Zeng from the Epoch Times. Recently we've been heard about uh, this act a lot, especially with uh, with the uh, deteriorating human rights uh, situations in China and in Xinjiang. So I'm wondering why this hasn't been used uh, or hardly been used at all, and uh, who inside the China, uh, US government uh, is responsible to uh, carry out or to use this tool, and who is responsible to find out the targets and uh, what the criteria to evaluate who should be targeted and who should right. not. Thank you. At, at the current time, it's there is not an organ. There is an organized process within the executive branch, but it's very much dependent upon information they receive from the missions and from the regional secretaries. Uh, that's also true in regards to trafficking. So what we need to do is sensitize the capacity of the different bureaus. So I couldn't agree a few more. We do believe that China has not gotten the type of attention it needs on not only Magnitsky uh, sanctions, but other areas of advancing human rights. So that's where most of the information comes from. It also comes from what's news, what's, where, where the hotspots of the world are. I mean, the, um, the, the action against the 17 Saudis 
uh, came as a result of public pressure. So there's other ways in which the administration will act. Some of it comes from Congress as we can initiate. The Burma sanctions was initiated basically by us. So you can use Congress, you can use the missions, or the our embassies in the different countries, or, or the public spotlight on a particular problem around the world. We want to have an organized way for doing this. This is why we're asking the regional secretaries to have accountability in each mission to have human rights as a forefront, recognizing that one of the tools available is to make recommendations for these sanctions. Uh, okay. Thank you, Valeria Hegisman, the Voice of America. Russian service. Uh, I know that there are a lot of uh, human rights violations around the world, but I wanted to touch specifically on Russia. According to the Human Rights Organization Memorial, there are more than 150 political prisoners in Russia, and we've seen the case of Alexei Sov, and uh, basically, international community couldn't help him. And uh, human rights violations continue in Russia. So, should we use Magnitsky Act more uh, as a tool, or and, and we've seen a lot of sanctions on Russia. So what should be done here right. to, to help people, people in Russia? And of course, Russia is one of the prime countries in which Magnitsky sanctions have been applied. Uh, I agree with you that Russia is a country that um, unfortunately is in the leadership of human rights violations in so many different areas. I spoke on the floor of the Senate yesterday in regards to uh, the, the, the attack on our freedom of of the media. And of course, Russia is the most dangerous country in the world to be a journalist. So uh, absolutely agree with you. Uh, our strategy for Russia, read the report I authored uh, at the beginning of this year about the asymmetric arsenal that they use uh, to um, have a repressive regime. It requires an all-out coordinated response, including our response when they're human rights violations. But it's much more involved than just human rights, what they're doing. But it all we, we got to stand up on the human rights side. So I agree with you. I think there's other things we can do. Congress passed a major statute, CATSA, in this Congress to deal with Russia and, and, and with mandatory sanctions. So I agree that we can do a lot more on the human rights front in Russia uh, and certainly stand up to those, uh, stand with these brave human rights uh, advocates in Russia that literally put their lives on the line to stand up for the rights of their citizens. We need to be on their side. And with that, uh, let me again thank you all very much for your interest in human rights. Uh, as I said, it's a, a powerful motivator. And uh, I think that we recognize that when we work together and we channel that, that energy, there's a lot of good things we can get done and we can affect the welfare of people around the world. So this is a cause we have to continue to fight as we go into 2019. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. That was perfect. All right, if the panel can come up, that would be great. Wonderful well, stage for the rest of the discussion. Um, just actually, I was so excited to introduce Senator Cardin that I didn't introduce myself. I'm Amy Lair. I'm the director of the Human Rights Initiative here at CSIS, and really pleased to see such a full room. Um, we have a distinguished panel. I'll be introducing each speaker when they speak, um, and there'll be time for, for Q&A afterwards. But I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of um, why I wanted to hold this event. I think. It's not a great time in the world for human rights. It's a, it's a pretty dark period, and so Global Minitsky is sort of this little ray of light in a not over, overall very positive picture. Um, I think we've all heard about trends of growing authoritarianism, increased danger for citizens who criticize their governments or identify corruption or try to protect human rights. Just to take a statistic, Global Witness issues a report every year on the number of, the number of killings of environmental and land defenders. This year it was 207, it keeps going up, and that certainly doesn't include all the people who are imprisoned or harassed or disappeared. Um, so it's a big problem. At CSIS, the Human Rights Initiative has been looking at what I call sort of a bottom-up approach to this. We've had an ongoing project called the International Consortium on Civic, Closing Civic Space that really looks at how civil society itself in countries where space may be closing for their activities 
can work together and broaden their constituencies to um, protect themselves. But I don't think it's gonna do it on its own, right? We need, I guess what you could call a top-down approach too, or we need governments to speak out on behalf of those people. Um, and so Global Minnesota is obviously a really key part of that. Um, because it's an important tool and it's a fairly new tool, I wanted to talk today about what, how is it effective? How can we make it more effective? And also talk and highlight a little bit the way different sectors are working together that you might not expect. So for example, NGOs work with government, but NGOs are also working with business to make sure these sanctions are implemented effectively. So on that note, uh, I want to introduce our first speaker. I have to get out a piece of paper because he has a very impressive background and I can't remember all the details. The first speaker is actually, we're not in order, is Robert Chinsky. He's the Senior Vice President for Policy at Human Rights First. And before he joined Human Rights First, he, he did a lot of things. He served in the Obama administration as the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. He also worked in the, in the Department of Defense. He worked at the UN mission, US mission to the UN. And, which I had not known, he started his career as an intelligence officer in the US Air Force and as an Iraq War veteran. Uh, Rob, it would be great if you could just, I know you've been really involved with the Global Vinitsky Act, I think kind of all the way through its journey. Um, if you could help people maybe understand a little bit more about how the act and the, the executive order fit together and then the work you've been doing with the coalition of NGOs and, and whatever else you'd like to talk about. Thanks. Great, thanks Amy and thanks for highlighting that I can't keep a job for very long. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so I just, I'll start off by building uh, on a point that you just made and also that Senator Cardin made that there just seems to be exceptional interest in Global Magnitsky as a tool of accountability and deterrence in the world. And I just wanna say uh, specifically on that note, there are a couple of different reasons. One is it is an incredibly effective tool if used appropriately and powerful. I've sometimes uh, thrown out a quote to journalists that it's something like a scalpel uh, combined with a tactical nuclear weapon because it's, it can be so precise, but also particularly in the way that the Trump administration has implemented it, it, it also holds at risk of sanctions such a broad swath of uh, human rights abusers and kleptocrats uh, that it, it's, it's, the power is really, I think, uh, less than most people even that follow the issue realize. Now, uh, combined with that potential power is the fact, as you just hit on, I don't think it's much of an exaggeration to say that these are really dark days for human rights. Um, and so when my organization, Human Rights First, which is based within the United States, goes out and talks to uh, partners who are interested in Global Magnitsky from all around the world, really a lot of what's motivating the interest is the fact that they feel like there aren't that many tools out there for accountability and deterrence. And so uh, we are really glad that we have this tool, but ultimately it is only one tool. And um, I think part of the interest, unfortunately, reflects kind of the situation that we find ourselves in right now. Um, so with that, I wanna say that as uh, a leader of an organization that can find very little positive to say about the Trump administration's approach to human rights and that, that believes that the much of uh, the world that we find ourselves in at present can be laid at the feet of an administration uh, that has in many ways abandoned uh, protection of human rights abroad. The Global Magnitsky Act does stand out, as you mentioned, as uh, something of an exception. And I think a lot of credit goes to the officials at the Departments of State and Treasury for how they have implemented this law since it went on the books just under two years ago. Um, I'm sure we're gonna talk about some of the designations that have been made to date. Um, I, I think you know one can both say that many of the designations have been important and also can criticize them in various ways. But in terms of how uh, state and treasury have gone about the process of building infrastructure around a tool that we hope will uh, be used in the foreseeable future, from the perspective of civil society, I think those actions have been really strong. So routine outreach from the government to civil society, um, uh, communication, formal and informal, uh, communications also with foreign governments. So it was mentioned kind of the proliferation of global Magnitsky-like laws around the world and the step that 
EU foreign ministers took on Monday to formally initiate a process for an EU level GLOMAG-like law moving forward. Uh, a lot of that comes back to our diplomats who are out there talking about this tool and, and working with partners uh, to try and expand its reach. Uh, so that's all super positive. Then to your prompt, Amy, on uh, the executive order. For those that haven't read Executive Order 13818, I would highly urge you to do so. The Global Magnitsky Act was a breakthrough for human rights and anti-corruption work, as Senator Cardin described. Uh, but the Trump administration, in releasing the implementing executive order, went well beyond the law itself and expanded the range of uh, potential targets massively when they issued the executive order. So it's, I, I won't go into the details now. We can talk about it in Q&A. But there, too, uh, they have defined the, the uh, number of persons that can be held at risk and the crimes for which they can be held accountable in a very expansive way, and that's really important to understand. Um, in terms of what civil society is doing, when I came out of the Obama administration was roughly around the time that the Global Magnitsky Act was passed into law, and just in speaking with my colleagues, including some on the panel today, uh, Everybody felt like they had achieved a real victory, had achieved a real victory in getting the law across the finish line. But it is so broad and so applicable to so many circumstances around the world that it's frankly pretty hard to wrap one's arms around, whether you're on the outside or more importantly on the inside of the US government. When one thinks about human rights violations and acts of significant corruption out there in the world, it's sometimes difficult to know where to start. Uh, so as kind of the, the outcropping of those conversations, what Human Rights First decided to do was to organize on a voluntary basis NGOs from around the world into a loose consortium uh, to try and present the US government with the best submissions possible uh, to form the basis of would-be targeting packages under the Global Magnitsky Act and the executive order. Uh, the theory of the case here is we're all advocates. This is what we do in one sense or another anyway. Uh, but it's not just enough to kind of put out a report, name an alleged perpetrator of a crime, and tell the US government you should target this person. Given real bandwidth concerns within state and treasury, as Senator Cardin alluded to, what we're trying to do is to do as much of the work of the US government on the outside as possible to mirror the process that goes on within Treasury's OFAC office uh, to give the administration kind of a head start on would-be sanctions designations process, uh, packages. I think it's debatable the extent to which uh, that's resulting in sanctions. We have, we know uh, the administration has designated some people that have uh, come from uh, the recommendations from civil society, and we're also hopeful that we'll see more of those moving forward. Um, but to circle back to where I started, the uh, support for this initiative has really been remarkable. Uh, we started with kind of the major global international NGOs, Human Rights Watch, uh, Freedom House, Transparency International, and really what we're seeing over time is that local NGOs working on certain specific countries are hearing about Global Magnitsky, beginning to understand the potential there, uh, and, and coming to us for a process in which we can educate them uh, and try and bring up the quality of the submissions that they're providing to the US government. And then importantly, also making the case to the US government for why it's in the national interest to make a particular designation, which given that ultimately uh, this tool is uh, entirely elective, is another critical component in addition to meeting the law's evidentiary standard. So I will stop there. Thanks, Robin. I just have a quick question. So the, the, I know you sort of have a coalition of NGOs working together. Are some of them not, they're not all American NGOs, some of them are on the, on the ground in other countries, is oh, that right? Ab absolutely. Um, no, it's really important to, to make that clear. Um, and uh, so at this point, we are dealing with NGOs, I think, on every inhabited continent. <laughs> um, and it, it's, important, it's important to note that often uh, it's, the local activists who have the sort of detailed information necessary to build a compelling targeting package. But given the procedures that some of my colleagues on the panel can speak to in greater depth than I can, uh, that level of information needs to be combined with 
corroborating sources from other credible outlets, whether they're uh, international NGOs or um, entities under the UN system and so on and so forth. So we kind of coach them through that process. Well, great. Um, I want to turn to our next speaker, our next panelist. Um, some of you who know and Andrea may have noticed this is not Andrea. Uh, this, however, is Sarah Morgan, who is also from Human Rights Watch and the director of their office here in Washington. So we're really thrilled she was able to come in at the last minute and be on our panel. Um, Sarah obviously has an important position now here in Washington, um, but has spent, spent a number of years on the Hill working for Senator Feingold. I believe she was a staff director staff director for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and really um, knows these issues inside and out. And I think she's going to talk, I think, a bit about both excitement about the Global Minitsky Act and the sanctions and its limitations. Yes, great. Thank you. Thanks uh, to my panelists for letting me crash the panel last minute. Um, Andrea, unfortunately, had a uh, a child with 103 fever, so we decided it was best that she, she handle that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak really briefly about how Global Magnitsky has impacted us at Human Rights Watch. As many of you probably know, we're a large global organization with researchers and working on about 90 countries around the world. Um, and what Global Magnitsky has, has done, and I think Senator Cardin really alluded to this, is given us a very, very concrete tool um, to use with our research. And it works in multiple ways. The excitement around the world for colleagues from the Philippines to Nigeria to Afghanistan has really um, been quite incredible to watch. For years, I've been trying to get them to engage on the Leahy Law, which some of you may know is a way to restrict funds to certain units, security force units overseas. And that has, it's never become a systematic effort for a lot of reasons that I won't go into, but in part because Rob has been so good at coordinating and organizing and explaining the Global Magnitsky uh, opportunities for us. My research colleagues are now working on the ground with the local activists. They are thinking about it as they plan their research reports. They're collecting the relevant information, even if it doesn't go into the report that they end up putting out. They are pulling it together and looking for ways um, to share it with us. And because we check, triple check, and quadruple check all of our information, by the time we're ready to hand it either to Rob or to the US government, State Department, and Treasury, and also to Congress, we feel really confident about our findings and that the individual uh, recommended for sanctions, ha sanctions has indeed committed the abuses um, that we've suggested. And we're very careful of libel concerns because obviously that is a huge area we do not want to fall into just like I'm sure every other group. So we take, uh, the, we take the obligation to be cautious with the information and careful very, very um, seriously and are always pleased to know that it's going to be vetted as I'm sure you'll talk about a little bit internally with alternative sources. Um, I have found the questions that come from my researchers as they begin to plan research that sometimes has nothing to do with the United States, right? They're looking at housing destruction in a certain city or security force abuse um, in a remote part of the country. It's now on their minds in a new way. And this is really exciting because for the most part over the last two years, what I've unfortunately had to explain to our researchers is that the United States, and particularly the executive branch, is not really a viable option anymore to be a human rights ally, that we can't rely on them in the, in the way that we may have previously <coughs> to stand up for defenders or journalists and to go after the bad guys, if you want to put it simply, because this is an executive branch that tends to focus on aligning itself in many ways with what we may have considered a traditional adversaries and not calling out even the allies uh, who are behaving in a, an abusive manner. So that's been a bright spot for sure when there are so few tools. The other thing I wanted to mention is that what Global Magnitsky has done is it's created this opportunity for more sanctions. Yesterday there was a bill passed on Nicaragua that is not a Global Magnitsky, Magnitsky Bill, but it's a corollary in a sense. It has some other provisions, but it basically looks to sanction some of the senior officials, four of whom have actually already been sanctioned under Global Magnitsky. But what it did, it sort of greased the wheels for members of Congress to work together to see sanctions as a viable tool, and then for Congress to pass the bill, often working hand in glove with the executive branch, which I think is a really strong opportunity for uh, both branches of government to, to continue to build on Global Magnitsky to fine tune or expand on some of the areas, particularly as we move closer to the sunset, there 
will be an opportunity to look back and say, what did we miss? What should we add in here? And so having some of these other bills uh, available to review and look through, I think builds not only confidence that the US can still do something, even if for the most part it seems like they've retreated completely from, from human rights issues. Um, so that's been a really exciting opportunity. I wanted to mention a couple of the limitations that we see uh, and how we are cautious around them. Part of, I think, being cautious just requires an awareness. But I think it was mentioned by Senator Carter, maybe you as well, Rob, that there are regions in the world that have not been hit by global Magnitsky sanctions, so to speak. And I, I wanted to flag Egypt as a country where there has been a pretty consistent recommendation, not only from the NGO community, but also from members of Congress for sanction. There are a number of individuals there who would certainly meet the standard based on uh, quite a lot of information um, that many of us have collected. And some of you may know that uh, early in the Trump administration's time, there was a memo circulated about human, how human rights could be used against adversaries but not against allies. And my concern with Global Magnitsky is that we do, to, in, to some degree, see this playing out, not across the board. And it's not, it's not, it's a little bit, I guess, more of an art, not a science, but I worry that it is being used more against uh, governments that either the US doesn't have a major national security interest in or governments where they don't feel, the executive branch doesn't feel they're natural allies. And that's very concerning to me because the broad-based application of this tool is part of what is, is so uh, valuable to make it really strong. So, you know, from the NGO perspective, we're gonna continue to submit these examples that we feel need to be hit. We have raised in many meetings the concern that, well, the Middle East region, it's a little different now because you've got 17 Saudis sanctioned, but we have said, you know, the Middle East has a lot going on and there does need to be some equality and parity in terms of the individual you look at to make the tool as powerful as possible. Um, Senator Cardin talked about the personalization of human rights abuses, and I think he's right. I mean, Human Rights Watch is sort of in the naming and shaming business. That's what we've been doing since we existed. Uh, I worry that this tool can be politicized for the good um, uh, of what the executive branch wants to see when the Minister of, the minister, the minister of Interior and Justice, right, in Turkey were yep. sanctioned. By all means, they, probably had a pretty abusive record, although we hadn't looked into it explicitly at that time, but they were sanctioned because of the detention of Pastor Andrew Brunson, who is an American detained in Turkey. And there are, as you may know, lots of people detained and imprisoned in Turkey, many Turkish journalists and activists and dissenters. And it struck me at the time that because the executive branch was pushing for the release of Andrew Brunson, that this was a convenient tool that maybe was merited, but because it only applied to the detention of Andrew Brunson, it worried me that the tool was being politicized. As soon as Andrew Brunson was released, the sanctions were lifted. So there's two ways to look at that. On the other hand, it was used to get what they want, and it's effective. It also sends a message, if you comply, you can get off the list, which is a really important point to make because the United States does a lot of list, list making in its foreign policy, and it's often unclear how one gets off the list, whether it's a ter terrorist list or something else. So I think it sent an important message that there, there is movement, things can change, and you can get off this list. At the same time, thousands of people are still imprisoned in Turkey, and the Minister of the Interior and the Minister of Justice have a role to play there. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm very cognizant of that. I don't think that's going to change because that's sort of the political environment that we're dealing with, but it does, it does require some measure of caution and consideration at the same time that the tool can be a real benefit to the community. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to say is I think the collective work of Congress on both sides of the aisle to pass Sergei Magnitsky and then Global Magnitsky has been a really important uh, way for them to rise as a co-equal branch of government on foreign policy. I believe in this administration that it's actually essential for Congress to be playing this proactive role because I worry about the damage that is being done by the executive branch. But to see Congress getting out there together and using this tool and pushing for the tool to be used in the case of Jamal Khashoggi's killing is a really valuable way for them to say, look, the executive branch may say A, but we're gonna remind you that it's not just us who cares about human rights and basic values, it's actually Americans, because that's who we represent. So there's an alternative path here without violating constitutional obligation for the executive branch to be in charge of foreign policy 
there is an alternative path here where America does play a leadership role, where America is engaged in human rights, and we're gonna use this really powerful tool and we're gonna keep it up, we're gonna pass other versions that are similar or based on it, and we're gonna continue to refine and develop our expertise. That message is really important, not just for us here in Washington, it's also important for my colleagues who are overseas in other countries to say, okay, there's one bright spot, and more importantly, for the victims who have been abused, for them to say the United States hasn't totally abandoned us, which is something I've heard a lot over the last two years, there is a way for us to still access some measure of justice, not justice as terms of criminal prosecution, but justice in terms of attention to the abuse and a restriction on their ability to move in the way that they had once done so. So I think it's a vitally important role for Congress. I actually look forward to refining the bill as it moves towards sunset because I think we've all learned a lot uh, since its passage and to working with our colleagues uh, here and overseas to continue pushing it forward. So thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I'm going to ask the, other, the next few speakers to try to keep their comments to about five minutes just because we started a little late and I want to make sure we at least can take a few questions from the audience. Um, Joshua White is next. Josh is the Director of Policy and Analysis at the Century, but he previously worked for OFAC, which is the part of Treasury really involved in sanctions, um, where he worked on nearly every sanctions program administered by the US government, <laughs> which is saying something. Um, and he also led the <coughs> of investigators that really gather the information to enable designations to be made. Um, in a prior life, he also an assistant treasury. He also uh, was the first senior sanctions coordinator for the Near East. So Josh has lots and lots of experience. It's very pertinent. And he's now at the Century. And if you don't know the Century, they're a really interesting organization. He'll describe it better than me. But in essence, they do forensic financial investigations and other investigatory work to basically follow the dirty money um, to identify kleptocrats in certain parts of Africa. So Josh, I am hoping that you will talk a little bit about what the Century does, because sure. I think it's really important. And then how you're working both with the government and companies. Sure, on this. Um, and I'm going to read some remarks as well. Um, so, about this time last year, the small team at OFAC responsible for rolling out the executive order and accompanying designations which would implement the Global Magnitsky Act routinely uh, and tirelessly worked into the night. Up until this point, it was often the case that staff assigned to lower profile sanctions programs would get pulled to help roll out sanctions whenever North Korea tested a new missile or tensions with Iran or Russia flared. But this time, the team focused on Global Magnitsky was the one that swelled in number as additional staff members were temporarily pulled from other sanctions programs to surge on what everyone understood was an important opportunity to launch a new era of financial warfare against kleptocrats and human rights abusers around the world. At the same time, the State Department and some from within the NGO community mobilized staff to bolster the information streaming into Treasury. Meanwhile, as this flurry was underway, many on the outside grew increasingly concerned that almost exactly a year after the act had been passed as part of the NDAA, no designations had been made pursuant to the statute, and there was little that could be made public about when and how the uh, administration planned to use this new authority. Would it be a handful of low-level perpetrators or token individuals from countries with already poor relations with the US? Some members of the press asked whether it would even be implemented at all. While those questions uh, were answered by the actions taken on December 21st, 2017, they are certainly still relevant as Global Magnitsky continues to evolve. I'll spare you the tedious process details and war stories that inevitably come with undertaking a major government action such as the birth of a new sanctions program, and instead focus my remarks on where those early efforts have brought us today and what it means for our, all of us who are stakeholders in the success of these sanctions. Civil society policymakers, regulators, and the private sector moving forward. What can we say about the success or failure of Global Magnitsky in changing the incentive structure and thus the behavior of those Who's, who these sanctions were meant to target, and what have we learned from how these sanctions have been used over the course of the past 12 months? We've learned this. The success or failure of this sanctions program will be determined not just by how many new names have been added to OFAC's SDN list, but by how serious the US government, international corporations, and financial institutions are about enforcing these sanctions and ensuring that attempts to circumvent them bring decisive consequences just like we have seen in the cases of Iran and North Korea. 
Now, a little less than a year after the realization of the first global Magnitsky sanctions, we find ourselves at another watershed moment that will have long-lasting consequences for whether this program truly will meet the hopes and goals of those involved in its creation. To be clear, there are strong champions of this tool at all levels of government who firmly believe in using these sanctions not only to advance geopolitical foreign policy objectives, but to do what is right and just and good for those suffering at the hands of those who steal from them and commit horrific atrocities. One only has to look back to earlier this year when the senior most treasury official responsible for sanctions and anti-money laundering became the first person in her position to visit sub-Saharan Africa and met with civil society activists and government officials in Kenya and Uganda to deliver a message about the seriousness with which some members of this administration are committed to using Global Magnitsky to fight illicit financial flows from South Sudan, a country my organization is uh, desperately concerned about, and a country uh, ravaged by endemic corruption uh, of its elites who also uh, perpetuate a horrific campaign of violence against civilians. Her June visit also spurred the issuance of an advisory by FinCEN the Financial Intelligence Unit uh, at the Department of Treasury, similar to Global Magnitsky, publicly highlighted how human rights abuses are enabled by corrupt senior foreign political figures and their financial, facil and their financial facilitators. Interest is growing in other countries about the potential for global Magnitsky analogs, as my uh, colleagues have mentioned, and we have seen the European Union and others take positive steps in this direction. There are also a number of banks whose staff increasingly pursue public-private partnerships engage with civil society on issues related to human rights and corruption, not only because they are concerned about sanctions compliance and reputational risks, but because they fundamentally care about making a difference in the world through their work. But there also are threats that would undermine what has arguably been the strong initial impact that we saw following the first round of global Magnitsky designations. The integrity of global Magnitsky is at risk when these sanctions are over-politicized but under-resourced, as many have said so far. The integrity of Global Magnitsky is at risk when it is used as a fallback response to calls from the Hill or members of the public for a new sanctions regime targeted on a specific country, set of actors or issues at the expense of ensuring that those sanctions have tangible consequences and are seen as meaningful. The integrity of Global Magnitsky is at risk when otherwise impactful sanctions targets are held back or discounted because of arbitrary concerns about the overrepresentation of one geographic region or whether countries considered to be allies will respond disfavorably. The integrity of Global Magnitsky is at risk when we avoid sanctioning those who are most deserving, even if they are in positions of power that make that, the right decision hard. These are, of course, concerns that exist with any sanctions program, but the potential and opportunities presented by Global Magnitsky make them all the more important to tackle at this early stage in its existence. All of us who are stakeholders in the success of the sanctions program have a responsibility to support its judicious and strategic use with clear expectations that, while it may not be a silver bullet for solving crises the world over, Global Magnitsky, when combined with other financial tools of pressure and effective diplomatic engagement, can fundamentally change the lives of millions of people around the world who suffer at the hands of those who bank in dollars. Thank you. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, and I know the Century has really done some interesting work on what they call network sanctions, which is That's this right. idea of trying, as I understand it, trying to target really like whole business networks around people. So one example of that would be in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Right. With um, you can look at the Gertler sanctions, but it's, it's really focused on a businessman and his whole sort of web of investments. That's right. And I think it's one of the ways these can be really powerful. Um, I want to turn to our last speaker, Robert Perry. I'm so happy you were able to join us. So Robert is Thanks. from Citi, as in the bank. Um, <laughs> and he'll be talking, he, he himself actually worked at Treasury for a number of years, um, including being the Director of Global Affairs in the Office of Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes. Uh, before Treasury, he was at, at NDI, actually, focusing on the Middle East and North Africa. And just a little bit about Citi, what I, some of the things I think Robert may talk about. He's, he's the head of the global head of US sanctions compliance. But Citi is interesting because it's a bank that's made a pretty significant commitment to human rights. It's had the commitment in place for a number of years. And so one of the things I'm hoping Robert will be able to talk about is how something like the global Minitsky sanctions either supports or doesn't support existing programming on human rights. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I know we're, we're, we're short on time, and I feel a little, it's a little bit like Sesame Street, like one of these things is not like the other um, <laughs> from the, the, the bank perspective. But, but given my background in, in, in development and then in the, in the government, I thought it would be 
helpful maybe to just give sort of a, a practical overview of, of the impact of these sorts of sanctions and the work that all of my, my distinguished colleagues are doing to sort of push this agenda forward when it hits a bank. Um, you know, when I was at the Treasury Department, we used to talk about banks representing the tip of the spear, right, of implementation of these measures of economic coercion, so sanctions and that sort of thing. Um, but just to sort of talk for a second about the, to debunk sort of two myths, I think, that we have about sanctions or, or how they work in, in very practical terms. Right? Um, I've heard a number of people say today, you know, there's the naming and shaming aspect of sanctions, and that absolutely is an aspect of sanctions. But if that's the only aspect of sanctions, then the sanctions were pretty poorly designed. Sanctions are designed to be a tool of coercion. Um, and as I think my colleagues all know, when, it's, when when the targets are well selected and it's part of a broader diplomatic and political effort, um, they can be incredibly effective. Um, and to just sort of touch on the, the, why I think the global Magnitsky sanctions in particular can be very effective is that, as you alluded to, Lisa, there, there, are, there are individuals here who have a lot of money in the international financial system. And what sanctions do is they block up that money in the international financial system. And um, for sanctions to be successful, we know that there are sanctions programs that have gone on for years, there are Cuba sanctions, um, there are, when sanctions, um, for them to be effective, the theory is you want a relatively high impact on the target, high dollar impact, which you certainly can get with these wealthy individuals that you may be targeting in the Global Magnitsky Act, at least some of them wealthy, um, and a relatively achievable goal. Now, you know, sort of cessation of human rights violations may not seem like a, a, a minor goal, but um, compared to the objectives of other sanctions programs or maybe regime change or something like this, it is quite possible, I think, to see progress on the human rights fronts because you have this high impact um, with a lot of dollars being stopped up um, and, and a relatively achievable aim. And I think that's sort of the, the, the beauty of, of, of Global Magnitsky in addition to its sort of lofty, lofty goal is when you implement that in a bank, you see real results. As we intake sanctions names, lots of them you, you may never come across in a transaction, but that's not the case for a lot of the individuals that we've already seen designated in this program. So, so it's, sanctions have a real world impact, a real bottom line impact. When you think about a, a bank like Citibank, and as Lisa said, we are, we are very focused on this issue. Um, we, we operate in over 100 countries, and so in, in a lot of places in sub-Saharan Africa, we may be the only U.S. bank present, and so this is, a, this is an incredibly important issue for us. But when you think about a bank like Citibank, and we are not by no means the largest bank in the world, Citibank processes, I wish I'd known this when I was at Treasury, about $4 trillion a day in transactions, trillion with a T. So that's about, that's about uh, global GDP every 20 days um, passes through Citibank and there are other banks of comparable stature. When you think about that from a sanctions perspective, a global Magnitsky perspective, when we put a name into our list and say block this person's transactions, block any money flowing through the bank and all the other banks do the same thing, the impact can be massive um, if, it's, if it's done right. So that's, that's a, the sort of myth number one is it's not just naming and shaming, there's, there's, there's real impacts. And then myth number two, and I'll leave it at that, is that, the, um, that there is, I think, also this, this sense that banks, banks sit on this treasure trove of information. Treasury, we used to say this to the banks, you sit on all this information, and there's this idea that the banks, you know what you're doing. Um, but consider that model for a second. I mean, the, the $4 trillion model, right, of that, that much money flowing through a bank every day. Yes, that's a lot of information that goes through a bank. Um, and yes, we're meant to know our customers, um, and our customers can be a person, they can be a company, or they can be another bank. When, the company, the, when our customer is another bank, and a, a bank like Citi has over thousands of customers that are other banks, we can't know their customers. And as this information flows through Citibank, we see you know, there's a millisecond in New York where we have the opportunity to block money that could be bad money. Um, we see a name and an account number and a value, and that's about it. So yes, the bank has information at its disposal, but what it lacks is that key first element, and that's intelligence. Um, and I think that's where the, my colleagues come in, that's where the U.S. coverage comes in, is providing that intelligence. And that, to me, is the ultimate value of that designation in a bank, is the initial intelligence, right? We get that name from the U.S. government, however they get it, if they get it from the NGO community or through the intelligence community or others. Then the bank has a lot of sophisticated tracking tools. Like we get that name, we can go and we can look and we can find the counterparties. Who has dealt with this person? Are they our customers? Who else have they de dealt with? And we can help map out large financial networks 
um, and really put, you know, really limit the ability of these actors to act. But we always need that initial intelligence. The most powerful way to get that is a designation. Um, and you can see with the Iran sanctions program and countries, you know, tying the banks tying themselves in knots to comply with U.S. sanctions, even when it violates their own local law, which is sort of a phenom an amazing phenomenon when you think about it. European banks are willing to violate European law to obey U.S. law. Um, the power is, is great, but we always need that initial bit of intelligence. And just to piggyback on, on what Josh was saying, and I'll leave it there, is the designation is the most powerful because banks around the world will follow it. What the century has figured out is that you can't always get that designation. As Rob was talking about, there's a legal threshold. Um, and when you, can't get that, when you can't get that designation, this information is still incredibly powerful, especially when you have banks like Citi that are willing to take action. Um, because we think it's, the right, frankly, the right thing to do, and we don't want to deal with, with these types of actors. Um, and so we have a whole process where we work with, with NGOs uh, like the Sentry to onboard information that maybe they're also providing for government, but we can act on it sooner. Um, we can look to see if, if we have clients that have dealt with, with individuals that, that are being um, highlighted by the Sentry and others. Um, and so that's the real, the power of, the, of the, the international financial system and that network is to be able to map out those linkages, but only once when we have the initial information. Well, that was great. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I know we're a little tight on time, so I want to turn to the floor for questions. Great, please raise your hand and someone will bring your microphone. There's one in the back. Hi, I'm Kirk Herbertson from Earth Rights International. Um, I think it was earlier this week, there was the New York Times reported on some uh, around the sanctions around the DRC and Joseph Kabila and Dan Gertler and how there was some efforts to influence the administration here about possibly trying to remove sanctions. So I guess my question for all the panelists is, um, do we need any kind of um, accountability systems in the US to avoid the kind of pay to play politics that might surround this use of sanctions as a key foreign policy tool? It's a great question. Let's get one more question and then we'll answer both of them at the same time. Um, there's another one in the back and we'll come to the person in the front next. Uh, my, name, my name is Kim Seng Man from Voice of America, Khmer Service. My question uh, direct uh, to Mr. Robert. Um, it, for the first time, uh, one of uh, Cambodia's top general around uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen is being placed under uh, sanction under uh, the Magnitsky Act. And, but the response from him was, uh, I have no asset in the US. I have no asset outside of the, uh, the country. Do whatever you want. So in the case like that, what can the bank do? Uh, or the, 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 uh, the law can do to him? Thank you. Great. Well, I, I think I'll let the panelists take, if you want to take one of those questions, just Josh. Josh. Sure. Josh. Um, so <laughs> what I would say is, we're uh, certainly concerned about uh, the reporting in the article surrounding the intense lobbying campaign by Dan Gertler and others who have been sanctioned um, to try to influence or otherwise uh, sway a process in which they can be uh, removed from sanctions or have sanctions relief. Um, luckily for us, um, there, it's not that easy for them. There are processes in place. I'm pleased to say that um, the administrative process that the Treasury Department adjudicates about who comes off the sanctions list, what they have to demonstrate in terms of whether or not they continue to meet their bases for designation, um, documentation to support that, is a process that is taken very seriously by uh, the career diplomats and the appointees who are running uh, OFAC and uh, the, the parts of Treasury that basically can thumbs up or thumbs down whether someone uh, is removed. What I will say um, is that we've also seen an intense campaign of people who, with rumors flying about who might be next, who are proactively going to the government to provide uh, information to hopefully hold at bay any additional designations they're worried about being sanctioned themselves. Um, and that is a challenge for us, but it's a challenge um, uh, at the Century, and I think others within the NGO community would agree, is one that we're up to the task of you know, making sure that we're providing information that clearly demonstrates uh, and corroborates um, what we're submitting, um, and that we're able to provide concrete information to rebut claims or refute claims where um, folks are trying to have sanctions relief or preempt uh, that kind of pressure. I think one addition to that, I think we've seen across Washington in the last 
you know, I would say a real uptick in the last five to six years, lobby firms, law firms, and PR shops who are really trying to whitewash the images of any number of governments. In the case of Congo, at one point, I think they had like three different mm -hmm. lobby groups, including one that was, um, that was uh, used just by the intel services, the security services. So this is a common thing that we see across the board. And what is, what, what is a relief is that I think they really, we see how seriously they take Treasury and state and the interagency takes um, the, the process by which you get off the list. So it's not just a question of, look, we're doing OK. It's a few things here and there. The point of the sanction is to incentivize um, better behavior or accountability in the home country. In the case of Congo, Dan Gertler is not going to be prosecuted uh, for anything anytime soon, but it does create opportunities for universal jurisdiction in other venues that is another added or ancillary benefit. Um, I will just say in the case of Congo, very quickly, my colleague who is now banned uh, from Congo, when the first round of sanctions w were, were imposed, she was talking to a number of individuals and somebody, uh, Congolese officials, and somebody offered her some money and said, could you please make sure I don't get sanctioned by the United States? And she looked at him and sort of thought, no, first of all, I can't, I know I don't want your money, A. B, I, I actually am not the arbiter on that. That's the US government. So it matters, they care. And in this case, to your point, even if they're not they don't have money in the banking system. The naming and shaming in certain countries is incredibly powerful and resonates. So it's an added benefit to any financial impact. But I love that story because it shows sort of the direct fear and concern that officials had about getting listed uh, in Congo. All right. Um, I think there was a question up here in the front. Yeah. Did you want to take that? Uh, my question is to Sarah. Uh, my name is Yasmin. I work with the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policies. And my question, because you mentioned Egypt as a non-hit area with the Magnitsky sanctions, um, if that, uh, what could affect your uh, fact-finding at Human Rights Watch or your research if you know that human rights uh, violations are committed under the law? Of the, the law in Egypt is... Uh, allowing certain individuals to commit human rights violations, and it's legal, like banning human, uh, like banning um, certain media outlets from work, like um, violation to, uh, to freedom of ex expression or violation to, to bodily safety in, in, in um, detention centers. It's a what? Sorry, one more question up here. Yes, uh, Eric Lachica with the U.S. Phil uh, Filipinos for Good Governance. Across the street, the uh, Philippine ambassador is already preparing for the visit of President Duterte uh, soon. So uh, uh, will the Global Magnitsky Act uh, be used to block his visit or uh, create a naming and shaming situation? Thank you. Who on the panel would like to take those questions? Did you want to answer the camera? Yeah, I yeah think kind of um, so I think actually a number of these uh, questions are related in that, you know, at the end of the day, these actions are taken by the Treasury working with state to protect the U.S. financial system from abuse uh, by people involved in this activities, as well as to accomplish foreign policy objectives. Um, and so it doesn't matter what the law is in Egypt about what's permitted or what's not. What matters is that the United States is not going to tolerate people banking in dollars, transacting in dollars. 90, Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the overwhelming majority, something like over 90% of dollarized transactions that are processed around the world are, 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 uh, are processed through New York or, or in some way hit the US financial system at some point. So if you don't have assets, if you don't um, have bank accounts in the United States, that's only one small piece of it. Um, at some point, the dollar being the domineering currency uh, worldwide is going to hit the U.S. financial system, and that's where we have that extraterritorial reach. Um, so that kind of pertains to the Cambodia question, but also to Egypt, where, you know, it, at the end of the day, this is the United States taking action um, that is in the best interest of our, our, natural, uh, our nat national security concerns, but also to protect our financial system from abuse. And so... We are privileged that we have this position economically and financially in the world. Um, it allows us to, to do things to help people in places where they need it, but it also is a matter of keeping our financial system safe. 
Does anyone want to have a response? That was awesome. Thank you for, <laughs> for making that addition. The only thing I'd say is I think the point that you raise is really important to your question, which is that these sanctions don't exist in a vacuum. And that if there isn't a larger policy process by which you address some of these other issues, the impact overall is going to be uh, limited. So yes, you can sanction the Egyptian individual even if it's in violation or what they're doing is consistent with Egyptian law. So then the question becomes, where does this sanctions tool fit in larger US policy to address what's happening in Egypt and to address the serious degradation of a rights environment and the horrifically broad, vague laws that are being used to go after in any, any and anybody that President Sisi seems to think will jeopardize Egypt's security. We've been commenting on those laws and, and how problematic they are for a number of years. We've been commenting on the detention and even the abuse in Sinai. So the global Magnitsky recommendation for us is part of this larger process by which we want to see a policy shift. I don't expect that to be the case right now in the case of Egypt, so I'm holding out some measure of hope that there could be a sanction on a few Egyptian officials. Any other responses from the panel? I'll, I'll just add, uh, I agree with everything that my colleagues just mentioned. Um, uh, with respect to the Philippines, um, first of all, uh, the Secretary of State reserves the right to withhold entry to the United States generally. Uh, so it, there's no need for a global Magnitsky designation necessarily to restrict travel into the United States. Um, now, whether uh, that action, uh, or global Magnitsky for that matter, uh, would be taken against the head of state, I, I think uh, is highly, highly unlikely under the Con uh, Vienna Convention, among other things. Um, that said, I, what, uh, what links situations like Egypt and the Philippines, as Sarah was getting at, uh, are we've yet to see any global Magnitsky sanctions in either country, um, but more importantly, just as Sarah was saying, uh, while those sanctions would send a very important message, and many activists believe that it's uh, an egregious omission that uh, sanctions have not been applied in either of those countries to date. They need to be part and parcel of a larger diplomatic strategy. At the end of the day, uh, all of what these sanctions and other sanctions are about is behavior modification. Um, uh, that said, I will say that in addition to the impact of blocking assets within the international financial system, um, we hear from activists on the ground in countries uh, that we partner with um, that just a sanction alone would send a very positive message to civil society in countries that feel very embattled at the moment. Uh, and we try and make that point to the US government as well. So yes, best when uh, there are financial assets that can be blocked. Certainly critical that designations are part of a larger strategy. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, there is some utility in the designations alone as a means to show activists that they haven't been forgotten by the US government and hopefully other governments that are implementing similar laws. Well, I think, I'm sorry, but I think we are out of time, unfortunately. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but I think this is a great discussion. I'm really glad we ended on the note of, yes, global <laughs> Minsky is really important, and we need more. We need cohesive policies on human rights. Um, I want to thank the panel.